never gotten enough of it. So, we proudly bring you more of it. The new 911. Timeless machine. On behalf of the Porsche Club of America and its executive council, I want to wish you the best of luck with your submission in the PCA Porsche only show. I'd also like to thank the folks at the Peterson for including us in this year's car week. I know we can't be together in August, but until next year, stay safe, stay healthy. Hi guys, this is my 2002 Porsche Carrera C4S. Uh, it's finished in black. It's got just over a hundred thousand miles and uh, the IMS was done and uh, the car runs perfectly and today I'm going to be running the back roads of California and heading up to Santa Barbara and Ojai with a bunch of uh, like-minded car enthusiasts who are glad to be free of the yoke of staying at home. Have fun. Thank you. Bye. Hope everybody is staying safe at home. Here's a picture of my 991.2 Porsche GT3 in Guards Red, 2018. Super fun, no tickets yet. The only modifications we've got are uh, six point belts and a BBI roll cage in the back. And otherwise it's uh, super fun and Hope you guys are all uh, staying safe. Hello, my name is Doug Barron. I'm from Malibu, California. This is a 1974 Carrera RS. It has a mechanically injected motor, all magnesium, case, and tranny. been delivered originally to Japan and raced as a rally car in Australia then put back to semi streetable and then I purchased it from Australia and we did a four year restoration and it is a blast Billy to and I'm speaking to you from Kent Washington and here is my 73 914 I like to call this car a 2016 914 because that's when I finished the 15-year uh, restoration. The interior is uh, slightly modified from stock. I just put a different steering wheel on it, a few little changes to make it more fun. It's got a 3-liter uh, out of a 79 SC in it. Uh, the only thing that's left of that engine is the, uh, the case. Everything else was redone. New heads, new crank, new cams, uh, all the bits and pieces were put in it. It's not perfectly clean today. We were just out driving yesterday making a little video for the local PCA folks. We don't get a lot of sun this time of year in Seattle and yesterday was sunny so I had to take it out. The 2015 Porsche 911 GT3 this is the 991 generation which they made GT3s of in 2014, 15, and 16. It has a 475 horsepower flat six with 325 foot pounds of torque, rear wheel steering. Also has dynamic engine mounts. Yeah, and I'm here at the Petersons Global Cars and Coffee. What a great idea. And I want to share with you my orange crush. Can you get behind the camera? and I'll take you on a little tour. This car is really unique because this car is a 1987 Porsche Turbo. I got it about 11 years ago on eBay. But what makes this car very unique is there are only three cars painted this color. It was special ordered, part of the Porsche paint to sample program in a six stage metallic orange. And only three cars were painted this color. There's a sister car to this car in the Chicago area. And there's a slant nose out there somewhere hiding in the world. I've seen pictures of it. This car was ordered with virtually every option you could get back then. It has heated power sports seats, 
limited slip differential, rear wiper, air conditioning, sunroof, all the options you could get on a turbo. And of course, I like to have a little fun. I drive this car, it's got 41,000 miles on it. Let me show you the inside real quick. Since we are at a Cars and Coffee. Heated and power sports seats, which are a pretty cool rare option. Steve Sylvan, I'm the owner of this 1974 U.S. Carrera. It's an early production Carrera, number 63 out of a total of 528 made. They came from the factory with the uh, ducktail, and this one, because it's an early production, received or benefited from RS parts left over from the prior year, so it has real RS uh, uh, flares and an RS ducktail that came with it. Um, when I found the car in uh, late 2010, it was owned by a uh, customer and the mechanic was selling it for him. So we went and saw it and uh, fell in love with it, realized it was an original lime green car, although it was guards red at the time. We saw through the frayed carpet that it was lime green, confirmed by the paint code. So that got me really excited and we went on a full restoration, bare metal, done by Freddy Hernandez at Vintage Sports Car Restorations. You know, everything has been touched on the car. The, the, the uh, restoration was completed in uh, May of 2012 and I've had it and cherished it ever since. And the engine has been rebuilt to 2.9 liters too for better performance specs as well by John Holleran. Thank you. Let's go for a little ride. I have a 1974 Carrera RS 3.0 replica. So I bought this car about three years ago in a dealership in Sacramento who specializes in Mercedes and BMW. Uh, a buddy of mine, Ryan Turi, alerted me to it. So what attracted me to this car is that it has steel flares that are ST, which are eight inches in front and nine in the back. And it also has the eights and nine Fuchs and this car already had these modifications back in the early 80s when nobody knew about the SD flares. So since I got the car, it, it, the look was kind of like a turbo. And so I wanted a replica of the RS um, 3.0. Uh, these cars are very, very rare. They only made 55 or so RS 3.0 1974. So what I did was I removed the turbo, the turbo bumpers front and rear, and then I changed the whole interior. I made it uh, more period correct. I put a roll bar, um, lightweight carpet, and, and all that. And then I changed the motor uh, to a 3.2 short stroke uh, high butterfly MFI with the uh, exhaust headers and the RSR muffler. So it sounds pretty neat as well. And 
we're ripping it through a canyon, a very tight canyon, and it's not scary. It doesn't feel too wide. It's not hard to place. It doesn't feel ruined. Oh man, it feels fantastic. Um, the 964 is a really narrow car, so when you add like a foot in width to it, it's okay. It just feels normal. I'm Gian Rajabzde from Los Gatos, California, and this is my 2013 Porsche Boxster in classic white with a yachting blue top and matching interior. I've had the car for about a year and a half and put about 11,000 miles of its 61,000 miles on it in that time. Um, the car is generally stock, aside from a GTS bumper that a previous owner installed, um, upgraded OEM wheels that a previous owner installed as well, and I've also added a painted license plate surround and installed a uh, backup camera, which the car did not come with from the factory. Uh, previous owner had also installed a top module, which will allow the top to go down with the key fob. And this car is a six speed manual and it's an absolute blast to drive and sounds fantastic while it's on, so without further ado, let's hear it start up. Three point four liter, six cylinder, with a red line around seventy eight hundred RPM. Hi, I'm Larry Fuline. I'd like to introduce you to my nineteen eighty nine Porsche nine thirty slant nose. For those of you not familiar with the slant nose, uh, it actually was modeled after a race car. Uh, Porsche came out in uh, late seventies, early eighties with the nine three five race cars. They were more aerodynamic, won a lot of races. That's what they were known for. Was they were more designed aerodynamically. Let me show you some differences. Where it's a little different than a standard 930, you'll notice there's no bug eyes. Uh, they've sloped the nose, that's why it's called a slant nose. You'll notice it's also vented. There's a rocker on this side that you'll notice, and then venting here in the back. The interior is pretty standard from a 930, except the steering wheel. If you look at the steering wheel, you'll see that it has a Porsche raised hub, which was unique to the, to the design of the slant noses. I'll start this up for you. stock hasn't been modified. Just so you know, they only made 60 coupes in 1989. 89 was the uh, last of the three years they made them. They made them in 87, 88, and 89, and they only made 60 coupes, so this is one of 60. Runs incredibly well. It's a real beast. Thank you so much for watching the video. 3.2 Carrera 911 from Ann Arbor, Michigan. All original, stock. Beautiful car. Owned it for two plus years now and absolutely love it. Very stock. 3.2 liter. And all stock. 
This is my 1963 Porsche 356B Super 90. Originally shipped in Germany. It was driven in Germany for about two years before it was shipped to the United States. We believe it was originally landed in San Diego before making its way up north to Los Angeles. Car's got a factory equipped sunroof. It's been driven probably about 112,000 miles and the longest trip that we're aware of is I drove it on a 3,000 mile nine day road trip across the United States. Drove like a champ. All right, let's go start it up. Hello, David Woods Electric here. This is the Omaze Peterson 911. I've been wanting to do a video for quite some time on this car, but it actually has been in quarantine at the Peterson. Everything that moves on this car has been restored, replaced, upgraded, uh, had a total restoration, new paint, new interior. Uh, we worked with Wayne Baker Racing to uh, upgrade the suspension and the brakes. Uh, it's basically a 75, 77, 911S. There's a hidden JL Audio Bluetooth sound system, heated seats, roll bar, hood is a fiberglass. All both hoods are fiberglass, and uh, the windows are lightweight polycarbonate. So what what this is, it's an 07 Carrera 911. Um, as you can see, um, it's just a regular Carrera, and we've up updated the wheels to Porsche BBS wheels. Um, 18 inch, which uh, helps uh, the stance of the vehicle. Actually, they're 19 inch. Take it back. Um, regular, regular Carrera rear end. Um, also, want to mention that I'm members with uh, two different groups, Fuel Fed and um, the Checked It Out group, which is a Porsche Porsche only group. Meets um, on a regular basis. Uh, just walking around the car a little bit. Give you an idea what it looks like. I like to keep it as nice and pristine as possible just to make sure that it's uh, in great shape. Of course the evening light always looks good. Upgraded the inside with a, um, a PCM, uh, a new PCM navigation system. Uh, and then I have new, a new stereo system. Uh, in the car as well, which I'll show you all the fun in the front end. The frunk. Pardon the towels, but you can see the you can see the amplifier down there, which uh, powers uh, eight speakers in the car. Um, again, it's an 07, uh, about 48,000 miles. So you got to do the math, but I'm assuming that's about 4,000 miles per um, per year. So great car, love it. Had it for a couple of years. Um, as far as the next car, um, this is a Macan S, and this is what really kind of started me in um, Porsche collecting, as it were. Um, this is a 2017. <clears throat> Um, it's an S. Uh, you can see the dual tail pipes on there. Fabulous car. Great, great cruising car. Um, this one is just about every spe every option that you'd want to have on a car like this. Um, of course, uh, upgraded stereo, sunroof. Um, it really has, it has a premium package plus. So it's great, I've had it for three and a half years. I plan on keeping it until the, until the wheels um, fall off. 1967 Porsche 911 S soft window Targa. Some unique features to this car. Uh, 1967 was the first year of the S class for Porsche and the 911s. 1967 was also the first year of the Targa top replacing the 356 convertible. 
Uh, very few were built. This is one of 483. Unique to this car is that it was actually purchased and driven for two years by the first Porsche dealer in Orange County, Chick Iverson. Chick sold it to the gentleman that we were able to purchase it from in August of 2017. We purchased it with all of the documentation, the original paperwork, uh, even the gentleman's finance docs, and it subsequently went through a 24-month nut and bolt frame-off restoration by Car Park in Costa Mesa. Nothing was left untouched. Every part, every nut, every bolt was restored to as original factory condition and that's the condition that you see it in today. I'm Steve Russell of Pasadena, California. This is my 1968 912 Porsche. Uh, I've owned the car for about three years and was absolutely smitten when I first saw it. Uh, some of the things which I really enjoyed about the car, uh, first of all, the paint. It's a uh, metallic blue, which is a very rare color uh, those years. It, uh, that's the actual name of the, uh, the color, is metallic blue. But it's got running lights, the Amco bar, uh, particularly appreciated the steel wheels for a, a very classic Porsche look in those years. And I absolutely love the interior with the hounds to treatment on it. Additionally, it's a five speed uh, car with uh, a five uh, gauge uh, cluster on the dash. Somewhat, uh, somewhat rare, I guess. And back to the rear end of the car. And so what I'll do now is start it up for you. ago in San Diego only had 69,000 miles on it uh, sunroof delete no sunroof very clean for for these models um, they're not really taken care of so much clean interior only a few cracks in the dash uh, original Porsche script seating and interior say hi dad very fun to drive handles uh, turns really really well uh, I love this car the 1998 Porsche 911 in Glacier White and I just want to show you some of the features of this car to put the gas you have to pull this handle and this is for the gas this is for the windshield wiper liquid to open the engine compartment you have to pull this handle and when you lift this up you will see the big fan which shows that this is an air-cooled car not a water-cooled it uses actually the oil to cool the engine down and when you want to check the uh, engine level fluid you have to pull this handle when the engine is running not when it's a stop and this is where you put the oil in the car thank you this is my porsche 911 carrera s it is uh, from 2009 it's um, got the pdk transmission it is 
I think what Porsche calls aqua blue and did a few mods. I did uh, an iPhone adapter so I could stream music and the other modification is on the back I have a New England Patriots bumper sticker. Thanks everyone. The 2008 997 base model. The car has currently 102,000 miles on it. Uh, it's a base Carrera. Um, I don't believe in garage queens. I believe in driving the, these cars. Um, I'm the second owner. Interesting note about the car. It's a Zanzibar red, uh, which is a paint the sample color. And I do believe it started out in Southern California. Uh, the muscle color for the Zanzibar red. If you look inside, it's a uh, manual. Um, I've kept everything original. It's on the original clutch. Um, the only thing I changed out was the head unit for a little bit more up to date. Um, Apple CarPlay and such. Uh, but there you have it, my 2008 997. Porsche 996 GT3. Very few sold in the United States. 1.2G on the skid pad, 190 miles per hour. No modifications needed. Zero to 60, 4.2 seconds. It is a real track tool, and a really fun car to drive. Probably the world's only Porsche with a vacuum tube radio. Hi everyone, my name is Sam. This is my 1987 Porsche Carrera, option M491, commonly known as a factory turbo look. Uh, factory wide body, but standard 3.2 engine and transmission. The uh, car has a black interior. It was originally built for the 1987 LA Auto Show, and I am the third owner. Hello everyone, Alex here from Car Throttle. While we're sad that we can't be in Monterey this year with Michelin for Car Week, we wanted to share this short clip from the Porsche Works Reunion livestream in 2019. Here are a few of our favorite bits. Lisa, welcome back to Car Throttle. How are you? How was the drive Great. up? Great, it was wonderful. We had six paint to sample Porsches, 911s all driving up to Monterey Car Week and excited for a great week this it's not, the, it's not the worst week in the world, is it? It's, oh, uh, <laughs> it's, it's busy, but it's very enjoyable. At now, week. we're stood in front of a car that I believe holds quite a lot of exciting news for you. Extremely exciting. Reveal all. The big reveal is now part of Flying L Racing Lucy. And we, uh, this is the fastest Porsche to ever uh, do the race at Pikes Peak this year. Here are my top five picks from the Works Reunion.
My name is Lisa Taylor. I'm a Porsche, Ferrari, McLaren, NSX collector. I also am a vice president of an aerospace company. I actually drove a, a Mazda RX-7 and I thought that was the best car in the world. And a friend of mine said, oh, you have to drive my Porsche. He had a 911 and I, I drove that 911 and I sold my Mazda RX-7 the next day. <laughs> yeah, I'm very picky about the, uh, the tires and the wheels and so I just feel like the cars handle so much better with Michelins on them. And the Sport Cup 2s are great for racing. I'm just not a black, white, silver colored car person. It started off with a red and then I started getting a little more bolder with a ruby star and the uh, we have mint green and uh, amethyst metallic and I just like the bright colors. So to have these paint to samples is, is very rare. I'm almost famous for my ruby star RS. It was a pretty bold move to order a ruby star Porsche. When it came off the truck, it was kind of a deep magenta, just beautiful color, so. I actually started going to Monterey Pebble Beach car show with my family in the 70s. And that just kind of got me going on to Pebble Beach and Car Week. And I've been going for the last 10 years and just, just driving down the street, you know, you'll be leaving Laguna Seca and that's almost, the most fun part of the a trip is just seeing all the cars driving down the street. Ferraris, Bugattis, Lamborghinis, Porsches. It's just all the cars driving around is so fun. It's just such a, a hype there. Great week. I love Monterey Car Week. I firmly believe Singer is a philosophy. We've managed to show the world our philosophy through the Porsche 911. Singer's ambitions are to produce beautiful things, uh, execute them beautifully, and to bring joy to folks. Lots of people worry about details. It's not a revolutionary thing for us to worry about details. I think restoring old cars is nothing new. Changing them, mod modifying them is nothing new. But I think what's unique about Singer's approach is that it's a particularly neurotic, 360 degree attention to every corner of our subject. Rob's quite particular and and we all love him for it, but at the same time, he's given me gray hair. So the story goes, he was walking around a car and he started putting post-it notes on the car. And he said, this needs improvement. This could be better, this could be better. And at the end of it all, he got a bit frustrated and said, everything's important. Got a spray can and wrote on the wall, everything is important. Having the right brand on a Porsche Michelin tires have been synonymous with Porsche for many years. When we started 10 years ago, there was no question that any other tire brand was going to go on our cars, especially when we undertook the DLS project with, with Williams. Finding out that Michelin were prepared to do a special tire for us was, was, was amazing. It literally allowed me to style the DLS in the way that I wanted, literally around the tire. Some people might struggle to believe, but it's absolutely true. never gotten enough of it. So, we proudly bring you more of it. The new 911. Timeless machine. 
Hello, my name is Mark andre Pfeiffer. I'm uh, working at Ruf Automobile GmbH uh, in the sales since nearly 12 years. And uh, today we're going to show you what we do in our company. And I said we because I also want to introduce to you Aloisa. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm Aloisa Ruf. I'm 18 years old and I'm currently working here in Ruf Automobile for my summer job. I'm very much looking forward to show you around what we do, what my family business does, and to show you more about the complexity and insights about where we're going and why we're here. And I think okay. we should get started. Let's go. Let's go. Let me take you to the heart of Roof Automobile, where it all started. It is essentially the paint job. As you can see, and as uh, Aloisa already mentioned, here we are now in paint shop. Um, apart from painting the actual cars, we also do all kind of interior parts, exterior parts. What you see here are the front bumpers and rear bumpers and side fenders of the new CTR. And uh, Aloisa shortly mentioned that this is a very special place and uh, she will also tell us now why. Well, this is essentially where the workshop all started. This is where my grandfather constructed um, the first space where he was actually building the cars. and fixing up anything you could find. Also here in the background you can see the birthplace of my father, Adolf Ruf Jr. and also where Adolf Ruf Sr. and Paula Ruf, my grandparents, lived. And also here to my right hand side you can see a little snippet of the gas station that they... It started in 1939, didn't it? Yes, yes, 1939. Yeah. So in the end, more or less, it came out of a family business where the grandmother of Aloisa was running the gas station while the father was running the workshop. Yeah, so, all next to each other, next to their home. Yeah, exactly. And with 80 years, it's quite an historical place already. And as a manufacturer, uh, as you know, we're able um, to fulfill a lot of customer wishes. That's also uh, why we decided to mix colors by our own. So we can paint around 280 to 300,000 color tones, just to give you an idea. Um, so for us, uh, yeah, it's always a lot of communication with clients to find out how the final product should look like. I'm going to take you now to the place where we built the hearts of our cars, the engine department. This is the engine department where all of our engines are manufactured. As uh, Aloisa mentioned, here we do not only engines but also gearboxes, um, starting from the restoration of classic cars with the 356 up to upgrades for the actual cars. Um, everything in between and of course here we build, uh, as Aloisa mentioned, the, uh, the hearts of our new engines of course, like CTR and SCR, which are fully built in-house. And uh, apart from just building up the engines, they are also tested as we have two dyno, engine dyno stations, which uh, we're going to introduce to you now. So this is our dyno from 1973, if you want to take a look at it. We currently have an engine in here, a 964 RCT engine that um, Carl is working on. We can say hello to him. Hi, Carl. Hi. And um, yeah, this is where we basically run all of the engines and test them before we put them in our cars. So basically, this is our electrically generated dyno. See what we do here is we've got our throttle here. So basically your foot pedal, gas, and here we've got a brake. So what we do is we slowly increase the revs and we brake the engine until we've got a specific rev number, so let's say 3000, and then we can apply different torque ranges. So basically from 100 newton meters until the maximum torque of the engine, which could be 450 newton meters. So that's basically how this works. And then over here, we've got our different instruments, so we can constantly look at what the engine is doing uh, in oil pressure manner or um, in pe uh, petrol pressure manner. And yeah, that's basically our system that we run here. I'm currently standing next to our CTR anniversary that was first published and displayed in our 2017 Geneva Auto Motor Show. Um, it is currently in production and it was a pleasure for me to show you around our family business here in Pfaffenhausen to show you what we do and to give you a little insight. And I cannot wait to show you more and to tell you more about our family history and where it all began and where it all will go. years uh, with a uh, roof in Porsche and uh, for this event a very good friend of mine uh, Mr. Richard Soderberg a very famous car designer uh, made this rendering and that was based on a frame that was in one of my early uh, eight millimeter movies because in the 60s we we hardly took any photographs everything was filmed we made making eight millimeter films. So all the old stuff is basically coming from those films. And it shows me as a 13 year old 
and I was driving the first Porsche that we had, which was this notchback or Carmen hardtop. And uh, we were, I was driving it in the winter, as you see, it was snow driving. I didn't have a driver license. I had to drive it on the uh, area of, the, of our yard within the premises of the company, you know. <laughs> So, here we are working on uh, earlier cars, we are working on air-cooled, on water-cooled, whatever it takes, it's done here. These are, most of these jobs here are big conversions and restorations. I'll give you an example. The yellow one here is a CTR2 Sport from the 1990s. This car lived its life in Japan, and uh, it came here for a full restoration. And the car will leave the company again like brand new, and uh, will go to the new owner. The car next to it <coughs> is a 993-based roof turbo BTR that is just recovering from a big collision repair. It had a frontal crash, and it was completely rebuilt here, and is leaving the company again as a, like a new car. The white one here is a roof CTR that was originally delivered in 1989, and it's uh, interesting enough, it's chassis number 007, and uh, this original owner of the car he wanted to have everything with a seven. That was his lucky number. When, when he came to the hotel, we had to find him a room number with seven. He would come at seven o'clock and he would leave at seven o'clock. Everything was around seven. So it has a speedometer for 370 kilometers. What we did not have at that time was a seven speed gearbox, but everything had to be seven. Engine number, uh, gearbox number, anything, chassis number. This is why this is our 007. <laughs> Now it's back for the restoration. Uh, this, this here is a 550 tribute car, and uh, we are putting in a, a very, very strong drivetrain with a six cylinder engine with around 400 horsepower. This is what the customer wants. So we, uh, we don't stop him from playing, we play with him. <laughs> okay. We are engines. This is the world of engines. When you look at our guys, Armin here is uh, just cleaning up for the next engine to be put on the bench. These are some specialty engines. This is not what uh, a roof car has today, but this is a special engine that we're building for a customer that uh, he wanted to have this way. It's a 2.5 liter uh, with 46 um, Weber carburetors, a very hot rod thoroughbred engine uh, for a, a race car, a fun race car, let's call it, from the 60s, for a 60s car. But it's really beautiful in every detail, as you can look. This is something that some of our customers put in their living room to look at <laughs> and enjoy it. <laughs> Over here, this is a, a restoration of a complete, complete 911S from 1971, a 2.2S. And uh, this is the engine, and the engine is being brought back to original specifications. And uh, it's the next one to be completed here. So this is uh, another engine here on the dyno, uh, obviously uh, water-cooled. And uh, here we're running the water-cooled engines, the ones that are going in the range of close to 1,000 horsepower, whilst our other dyno is more predestined for the um, air-cooled engines. And it is good up to 600 horsepower. Right now there's no engine mounted, but we call this dyno here, this is our dinosaur. You know, this is <laughs> not the latest technology, but very reliable te technology of, of German quality. It's a Schenk dyno.
This car is about 10 years old. It is a RT12 and it has been shipped to us to be freshened up, new paint shop, new interior. So the customer enjoys collecting roof cars. He has now already four and uh, he's happy to receive the car back to drive it in Miami. This is something that may be of interest also. This is a mock-up that has been milled out with a milling machine. You see it's just one section from the A pillar to the B and C pillar. And we needed that to make this uh, special frame here fit for our CTR, the new one which has a secret air intake here for the combustion air. And to make sure that everything fits properly, we were making this, uh, this mock-up here. And um, the door shows here very well how much the door in our new car has grown and has become uh, with a stronger shoulder. And because this is a standard door from a 911 and you see we are about 35 millimeters farther out. This is a very good demonstrator. I have to shoot this way. Are oh, you shooting? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> okay. See, to understand this. Okay, yeah. Now we go to the paint shop. So the guys are preparing for paint here. So Chris, Top Gear returns to BBC on Sunday, August 30th, and um, the show is currently in production, and we're really happy to uh, you know, exclusively reveal uh, some of the new clips from the episodes uh, in our upcoming Peterson Car Week. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what to expect from the new season? It's the, it's the usual mixture of outlandish adventures, Nepal, Peru, um, cheap cars, uh, expensive cars, Cars to make you cry because they're beautiful. Cars to make you think because they're clever. Cars to make you wish you had more money because they're fast and exotic. Uh, we've got a fighter jet. Uh, we've got uh, an international sports hero being thrown off a dam uh, attached to a bungee rope. Uh, it's pretty broad church, Top Gear. And, and I'm, that's why I love working on it because you, you have no idea what you're going to do next. And at the end of a season, you see the body of work and think, have we really done all that? <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's there's it's an embarrassment of riches. I'm really really proud of this run that you're about to see. That's exciting. And and one of the clips we saw um, was the VW Pikes Peak. And what was that uh, wheeling it around uh, the corkscrew at Laguna Seca? Uh, no, I, we were at um, uh, Portimao in uh, oh, in Portugal, Portugal. and um, which actually has a few areas that are not dissimilar to Laguna in in, yeah. in, the, in its topography. Um, well, first of all, you've had it in the museum. Have you ever seen an angrier-looking motor car? It just looks like it wants to bite you. Yeah. Um, I, I approach it the way I do. You know, if you, if you put a big hairy spider on this desk now, I'd be like, well, you just, it's a bit like that, isn't it? Um, it's got a splitter that will just take chunks out of your ankles. Uh, it's, this is an unlimited vehicle. It's not conforming to any regulations. It was just designed really to go up Pikes Peak as fast as possible. Yeah. Uh, and then to go and do a bit in Nürburgring and a bit of other places. So um, its performance is violent. I've never driven anything like it. I've driven the Formula One car, and this accelerates faster. Basically, it's uh, it's has it's four wheel drive and it's got a massive amount of torque and it just goes yeah. from from a standing start. It lights all four wheels up. You can you can put warm slicks on it and it just lights them up. So it comes out of corners unlike anything else. But the braking performance is phenomenal because it was designed to go up Pikes Peak. You can't warm your brakes up. The, the, when Dumas is going up Pikes Peak, the first time he has to hit the brakes, they've got to work. 
So the pad material is, un is really, it's uncommonly soft. And you can actually feel it. When you, when you smash the pedal, you feel it sort of biting into the rotor surface. It's really weird. So it'll pull four and a half G under brakes, I think. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it partly excites me and partly terrifies me. If that's the future of, of motorsport long term, I'm worried because it's silent. And because of that, it feels a little bit sterile, mm -hmm. inert, because so much of motorsport is visceral, it's noise, um, and it's drama. And this, this thing, even though it's, it is dramatic from the inside, as we all know, you can be putting 4Gs into a corner, but a spectator just thinks, well, he's not really getting very fast. Unless you see, it, it, motorsport doesn't look fast until you sort of get to top fuel drags to funny car stuff. That's when it visually, your eyes go, whoa, that was quick. Actually, racing cars never look fast. Um, but what is exciting is just what they might be capable of soon. And I think the limiting factor will be the driver, quite simply. You know, if, if, they, if VW can produce that car now, in five years' time, they can even have something that pulls, what, seven Gs. I think, that, you know, we might have G suits for racing drivers not in the not-too-distant future. How ridiculous is that? Amazing, yeah. Designed by uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, by Mr. Musk. I'm sure he'd find a way of doing it, wouldn't he? So, and no, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable vehicle, but it, but it, it also serves to highlight the limitations of electricity. You know, it's just yeah. 15 miles on a charge, and then it needs two hours to charge up again. Okay. Yeah. And, and kind of on that angry note, looking at that car, you know, another electric car that we had in the museum was the Cybertruck. Oh, yeah. Where do, you, where do you sit on the Cybertruck? I think it's interesting. I mean, I think if, if the design of it is able to be produced, it'll be like nothing else, you know, on the road when it comes to design. Because in person, the car is massive. You know, it's almost 20 feet long. Um, and it's, you know, eight feet wide. It's like the same track as an H1 uh, Hummer. Uh, and I think that the power, you know, the power of it's what's really amazing. You have that much mass, you know, probably 7,000 pounds moving at a sub three seconds, zero to 60. And, you know, like you mentioned, still pulling. And but, still- but Surely if you put three of them together, it'll stop you spinning on its axis, won't it? It's got, <laughs> got like super, be like Superman. Look, yeah. my, my, I, I take with Tesla, I don't assess Tesla in the way I do other cars. I, t I tend to take a step further back because I think what Mr. Musk does brilliantly is he subverts the car industry. That's what he does. He's not. I'm not, I don't know what his motives are. I think anyone that tries to get inside his brain would be out of their depth. He's a much cleverer man than me. But what he does is he subverts. He, he seems to look at an area and go, let's, what, let's just go in there and disrupt. Yeah. And what he's done with the Cybertruck brilliantly is he's just subverted in one stroke the entire genre of, you know, the American truck is what he's yeah. done. Is he, and he's got people talking about what a truck should be and what it should look like yeah. and i think that's a really interesting way of doing it. even if he doesn't make it looking like that what he's done is he's already altered what people will expect from that vehicle from now on yeah um which i think is very clever mm -hmm. so i personally think it looks great yeah because it's because it just doesn't look you know we Stepped right you, out lot of been, picture, you, you lot have been knocking out 150s and rams long enough you know it's probably time to move on yeah and and uh and i think you know the, the claim performance will it meet the claims probably not is there a, is there a, probably an awful lot of hot air in some of the statements made around it probably there always is with tesla but he always delivers you know he always delivers and yeah. um i'm 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 a fan i'm fundamentally a fan like but i do love the way he just takes an established area of a marketplace and just goes right i'm going to go in there and i'm just going to i'm just going to basically lob firecracker in there see, right what the yeah. see what happens and, and that's what he's done here and you mentioned dangerous and ridiculous i mean we saw a little preview of the colin mccray piece uh can you tell us a little bit about that piece and you know what it meant for you i'm an unashamed colin mccray fan i'm at that age in my mid-40s where when he was at his absolute peak of his career, he dominated the rally scene in, in Europe in a way that few other people had because of his, the style of his driving and this absolute, you know, go hard or go home attitude. Um, and the language of the car was just, was just outrageous. Whenever you saw it, it was just at a bigger angle than anyone else. Uh, and, of, and of course, 
Subaru spotted this and I think the McRae Pro Drive Subaru Alliance was was a type of marketing exercise perhaps the likes of which we'll never see again you know people were buying these blue Impreza turbos in Europe because this guy was winning rallies that hasn't happened since I mean how many people buy a Mercedes on the back of what Lewis is doing at the weekend yeah. it just doesn't happen does it really yeah so there was this there was this beautiful synergy between mercurial driving talent that didn't say an awful lot these weird sounding sedans with their crazy flat four engines and then they're actually selling the cars on a Monday afterwards so to actually go and drive that car was very special and that's owned by uh, Alliston and the family still own that car it's only been driven a couple of times by for demonstrations by Jimmy since uh, that year and we lobbied them hard. We said, look, we're celebrating an anniversary here of his championship year. Will you let us? And they said, yeah, you can. And that's when you're lucky with a bit of clout from Top Gear. I think if I'd been Chris Harris on cars from YouTube, they'd have gone, uh, no. <laughs> so I felt very privileged. And it, you know what? It was sensational. There's something about that era of rally car, that Group A rally car, where you've got, it's a turbocharged engine, but not too turbocharged. The response is still good. You don't have to start it with five laptops. It turns on a key, and you've got a wonderful mechanical H-pattern dog box, three pedals, and away you go. Short wheel base. I, mean, I didn't give it the potatoes because it felt disrespectful to do so, but I gave it enough to realise how special that racing car was. And I, I, the whole film was... It was a really special thing to do. The, 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 you know, the 20-year-old me couldn't believe that I was getting the chance to do these things and to make this film. And I have to say that when we played it back in the studio with Jimmy, his father, and Alison there, and her new husband as well, you know, I had a lump in my throat at the end. I think there's a, it's a pretty poignant piece. And um, there, yeah, a few tears were shed. And you brought up a really, really good point because we were actually discussing this over the weekend of... You know, what do you feel was the point when, you know, racing, you know, stopped on vehicle sales? So there was a point where, you know, you'd go to the dealership because you saw cars being raced in competition and winning. Uh, what do you think was the last car to really, you know, uh, compete and also sell cars afterwards? It's a really good question. I mean, it might be that the Impreza was it. Certainly in Europe. We we have we we went down a route of producing racing cars that no longer looked like the cars on which they were based a long time ago. So we went into silhouette formula, prototype formula, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And you guys always had, I think, in America, vehicles that at least doff to cap to what they were based on, a Trans Am stuff like that. You know, it, it still looked vaguely like a car. Yeah. So I think uh, it might, you know, the Impreza might have been it. Nothing's happened in rallying since. I mean, you can argue that in 2001 were Ford selling Focus RSs on the back of what Delacour and McRae were doing for, for Ford, well, the you know, M Sport World Rally team, mm -hmm. potentially. But after that, how many people bought a Citroen on the back of what Sebastian Loeb did? He won nine world championships. I never wanted a bloody Citroen Zara on the back of that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's really happening now. You could argue that this new Yaris that's coming out could be quite interesting. Yeah. And I think people, people might do that. But, no, it was a bigger thing, wasn't it? An entire brand was, was sustained on the back of motorsport, and it certainly hasn't happened in Europe since. Yeah. Yeah, the only other one that I could think of that was really pushing hard would be the, the Z cars. You know, when... Uh, the 300 ZXs with Newman, they finally did that last push in the early 90s before everything started to pull back and they really yeah. went back to their racing pedigree. That, that, could, that could have been. You can argue that Porsche, Porsche yeah. has the most seamless association between its race car activities and its road Absolutely. car activities. But if you, if you flip it on its head to debunk it, you know, how, would they sell fewer GT3 RSs if they weren't doing IMSA? No, they wouldn't. They'd still sell every single one, wouldn't they? So that answers your question. And, and you've done a few seasons in Top Gear, and you know I've I followed you personally. And how did that all come about? I mean, what was that call like? You know, coming over to Top Gear and that transition. I, I, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? I learned that in this world you should never say never. Um, yeah. And in 2015, I made several quite public utterances on the back of Jeremy and Richard and James leaving Top Gear. That uh, why would anyone want to do that? Because you're destined to fail. You've been given a poison challenge 
because you could never follow them. And then they phoned me and said, do you want to have a go? Now, and I, at that point, I'd written a story on Jalopnik saying, anyone does this is mad. And I think I'd also gone on Joe Rogan's podcast and said the same thing. So I'd pretty much covered all bases and saying I wouldn't do it. Um, but my world was changing quite quickly. I was um, struggling with YouTube. YouTube was in a difficult phase where the CPMs were so low that you couldn't really make decent films pay. And then they tried to pay more situation with myself and JF Musial. We tried to make that work, but that was a disaster. I've got three children. I was skint. Um, and I, I just thought, when they said, do you want to have a go? I thought, I haven't got much else to do. I've got some bills to pay. I'll give it a go. I knew it was going to be a very, very tough gig. Mm-hmm. But I didn't realise how tough it was going to be, if I'm honest with you. It was a very, very difficult first 18 months doing it. Mm-hmm. The first season wasn't received well in the UK. Um, it was a bit of a muddle. It was always going to be an impossible thing to do. I mean, we're talking about one of the most established television shows on the planet that was established because of its its presenter lineup. It wasn't because of the name Top Gear. It was because of Jeremy James and Richard. Um, and to just change that was always going to be, I don't, I don't want to qualify the word impossible, but nigh on impossible is probably fair enough in this case. But I think we've done a great job getting it back to where it is now. Yeah. I'm very proud of it. It's been a slog and it's been difficult. But uh, I, I don't tend to give up on things. And I just view it as a, phase of my life I, you know I, I loved the internet I loved doing YouTube I loved working with all of the guys from Drive you know, Farah and uh, Alex Roy and Spinelli and JF I love them to bits and they're great talents but you know someone gave me a chance to go and make big budget car television I never thought I'd have that chance and it's a it's a different creative challenge and I really really enjoy it, it doesn't mean I don't miss YouTube and just how easy everything is and how quickly you can do things mm-hmm. um, so yeah, it, uh, but the ins and outs of it, it was pretty complicated. It was on, then it was off, then it was on, then it was an off. And then I got offered half the work that I thought I was going to get. And then I was a bit stuck doing it. And yeah, I have to say it was, it wasn't easy, but I'm really glad I stuck it out. You had mentioned, I mean, you know, going, uh, segueing from YouTube to, um, you know, Top Gear with the budgets. I mean, that's one of the, the questions is what what is it like from a production side going from, you know, an Evo to a Top Gear? Well, it's, it's, it's different gravy. And, and what you, what I've learned is to respect both processes, that both are valid, mm-hmm. that both produce the content that, um, that they should produce given the money being spent. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very easy for those sitting in the, in the opposing camps to criticise each other. So that quite often, you know, the, the YouTuber, when I, was, when I was doing my channel on YouTube, I'd be thinking, well, we can make a film that's nine tenths as good as Top Gear for one hundredth of the money, mm-hmm. and then the person in the, sitting with the big television budget is looking down their noses at the YouTuber, going, "Well, I mean, look at the grade on that; it's a bit ugly. That grade." Mm-hmm. Well, the reality is this: the the cheaper content is is brilliant because it's fast moving, it's exciting, and you can keep going. And we, myself and Neil Carey, did we used to do fifty one films a year, mm-hmm. um, but we just knocked them out. You know, there's a, there's a there's a, an, an element of curation and love that goes into big budget television where you can just make stuff that, that hits home in a way that, that's so sophisticated the viewer isn't even realising it, you know. That's, that's properly crafted television. And I've learned that now. I work with some very, very clever, talented people and they can tell a story so seamlessly. That Colin McRae film mm-hmm. is, I think, 12 minutes long. That's nothing. If you told me that I would be reduced to 12 minutes to tell the story of my hero's championship year in the World Body Championship, I would just be livid. I'd want two hours minimum to do that. But these guys and girls at the BBC crafted a film in 12 minutes that I think leaves even enthusiasts fully satiated. You know, you feel that you've nourished by what you've just seen and heard. But, and and that's, that's the discipline of, of creating great generalist television. Whereas... I think quite often on YouTube, we lack that discipline because we've got so much time. We can do what we want. You get lazy and you just, you basically crap on for too long. Yeah. Um, so those, those are the two sides. I love both. And I think I'm at my happiest when I'm doing both at the same time. So I'm going to be doing some more YouTube at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Me and Neil going back to our roots. And I love yeah. doing that. And I think if you've got both, then you've yeah. got the, you've got the, you've got the savory in the sweet. You know, with, with access to the vehicles, uh, what are you most excited about? I mean, do you still get the same kind of, you know, glee when, uh, you know, a car shows up like Colin's car? I mean, what's coming up that you're absolutely 
uh, excited to drive. I'll never lose that excitement for any motor vehicle. I, I'm I'm a car obsessive. You know, it's yeah. why you know something like your establishment resonates for me because it's a celebration of 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 the wider car culture and what that means. Mm -hmm. It's not just about cars that are worth $1 million or $10 million or $20 million. In some respects, the older I get, the less interested I am in the, in the more expensive, more esoteric stuff. I, so, I seem to sort of regress back to cheaper cars that have had a, a greater effect on more people because actually then you have a bigger audience to uh, interact with because they understand more, don't they? You try telling people a 250 Joe is great. Well, how many people have driven one? They can't really <laughs> identify with you, can they? Um, so the access is, is great, but it uh, sounds awful. I had pretty good access before I did Top Gear and I wasn't struggling to get into pretty much anything then. Top Gear helps a bit, but it's not, it hasn't radically altered it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, coming up, what am I, I've just driven the SF90. Mm -hmm. um, which I'm not going to give the game away. I thought that was very interesting. First attempt at Ferrari trying to have a four-wheel drive hybrid petrol electric supercar. Where that story ends, I don't know. Um, uh, I've just um, I've driven the RS6. I yeah. think are you get are you getting the RS6 estate, or are you just getting the RS7? I think we're getting like less than twenty of the estates. I mean, we're getting an extremely small percentage of them, but we will get a few. What is it with the authorities denying you fast station wagons? I mean, the stuff you've know. missed out on over the years really is. It's the only thing my country has over yours. We get station wagons. You've got money, influence, power, but we get station wagons. Only station um, wagon is the, the CTSV. That's the only one that we've gotten that's a powerful station wagon. That, and, and the Mercedes, the, you know, the E63 station wagon. Those two yeah, we have. But I completely right. agree. So... Uh, I drove that. It's impressive. I mean, right now, the, we're in a very strange phase. I think of, of the last year, the run that we're about to go out, the Taycan, the Porsche Taycan, is the most impressive vehicle I've driven in the last year. I mean, they've you can tell Porsche has thrown the kitchen sink at that thing because it realises that its first effort in that yeah. space has got to be spectacular. Um, of course, it's amazing, isn't it? You drive this thing, and in every meaningful manner, it's better than a Tesla. I don't want the Tesla army coming to stab me or threaten me like they normally do, but it, objectively, it's a better car than a, than a Model 3. Of course it is. There's a lot more money. But the reality of ownership is that Tesla's so far ahead in terms of infrastructure. Yeah. If you were going to buy one, you'd just have a Model 3. Well, I, don't, I would just, you know, the Porsche's building these, whatever they are, 800 watt mega stations yeah they're building four in reading that's it for us four so i oh, yeah. I, I, just I just don't really get it but so that was that's the most impressive thing i've driven the speed tail film with the f35 lightning what's it, what's interesting about the speed tail is that you 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 dismiss its its mega speed credentials based on its power output thick end of a thousand horsepower which in that world you know when you're up against chirons isn't actually that much well yeah. so mad that we're even talking like that but what was amazing about the speed tail was that it demonstrated that lack of mass uh low frontal area and, and lack of drag constitute mm -hmm. massive speed over 100 miles an hour because between 100 and 200 that felt quicker than a chiron to me yeah um, i didn't expect that at all and the center driving position came back yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. That's 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 a gimmick that I'll never ever tire of. That's that's just superb. Um, we had we actually had a very interesting technical issue. Your your viewers might find this quite interesting. We had a lot of briefings and a lot of planning going on around being being anywhere near that that fighter jet because it's a it's a very complicated bit of kit and and if it goes wrong, it goes spectacularly wrong uh, when you're filming around these things. So we had to have all these. I mean, we went on for weeks. Any other night before. And with the pilot, lovely chap, he ends up in the studio at Top Gear. He's a really good guy. He looks about 12. Mm. Um, and uh, he just said to me, all you need to know is, if I get a jump on you at the start, and you're within 50 metres of the back of the jet, because I was only about 40 feet to one side, I'm mixing my metric and imperial here. So I'm sort of 25 metres to one side. And he said, yeah. if you get within 50 metres, that it's a problem. You need to either turn right onto the grass or just get out because it will lift the front of the car. We've done some calculations. There's so much thrust coming off the back of the jet that it will just flip you. Even if you're doing 160 with a bit of downforce at the front, you're off. And I thought, okay. Anyhow, we we did a lot of um, 
calculations to see where we might be down the runway. Because we only had two attempts to get this open, this start shot done. Yeah. First time we do it, it the, the McLaren went off the line like a stab rat. It just went bang and shot off the line. And the jet, the jet had a bit of a fumble and went. And I was much further ahead than we thought. Mm-hmm. We thought the jet would be ahead, actually. Yeah. And he took, and I just saw him come up by the left hand side of me. And uh, those things are big when they come up by the side of you. It's a, it looms. You feel its presence before you see it. One of those things, of course, the noise helps as well. <laughs> and it, and it, and it just goes to lift off, and it just takes off right next to me. And I just thought, well, do I stay with it or do I? If I break now, I've ruined the shot. And this is yeah. the money shot. And it just lifted off right next to me. And then as it went, the whole car just started to shake, and the front of the car. I swear, you don't see it. We didn't have yeah. a camera. We didn't have a thousand mil lens on it. But the front of the car, that surface of the road went. And then sat back down again. <laughs> yeah. and, it went, as it, and it started to go. And I thought, this is going to make a fantastic job. <laughs> and then it just went down again. And I didn't say yeah. anything about more in the film. You didn't want to acknowledge it had happened. Yeah. So you know, that was, there, there, there was, there'd been some good moments with, with that stuff. Going forwards, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm fascinated by Volkswagen's electric car family. I, yeah. I just don't know how that's going to play out. But let's face it, the car industry is as affected by what's been going on globally as any other industry. Probably more. I think it's, it is... It, I wouldn't want to be a, running a car company now. What a thankless yeah. job. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, so, it's very difficult. And I think, honestly, with... Uh, you know, like you mentioned, promotion as well. I mean, if you think about it, all the shows are closed that really launch vehicles. Uh, so not only is the propulsion technology kind of a new territory, but just the, uh, you know, amplification of everything is also a new territory. Uh, and I think, you know, people are going more digital now uh, and the world has to adjust to that. I mean, you know, the whole world's adjusting to a new situation, so. The technology in this transitional period just isn't quite there and people aren't stupid people are quite switched on and if you're sitting on a three-year-old gasoline or diesel engine vehicle at the moment with some mild hybridity you're not going to suddenly jump into bed and spend another fifty thousand dollars to change into the latest thing now because you know full well in three years time it'll be obsolete Mm -hmm. um and i think people are are wising up to that you know car multi-billion dollar organizations that need to keep selling stuff i just don't know how they do it i, I feel really really sorry for them you know it'll, it'll be interesting to see you know over the next couple of years to see how you know used car markets change and maybe how manufacturers adapt to that Let, let's try and let's let's try and scenario plan a bit further into the yeah. future i think in 15 20 years time yeah how many car what, four maybe five car companies i mean you're gonna have You've You've seen it happen over history. Yeah, I mean Yeah, you 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 you'll end the very nature of of an electric platform is one of uniformity of of just being a white good. It's it's it will be judged on how efficient it is, how fast it is, you know, purely empirical statements. Yeah. And at that point, you don't need many of them because they, you know, it's not like having a flat 12, a flat 12 engine or an inline six or all yeah. of the things that engendered personality into motor cars are gradually, sadly, being bought out. They're being removed. And that's, that was, that's a process you can rage against or you can embrace. I'm a person who I'm trying to embrace it. And I, and I believe so strongly that engineers and their brains will salvage something from this and it, it'll be the way it'll be in the way they drive in the way that they vector talk between front and rear axles in the way that they slide or don't slide and other stuff yeah. but sadly the powertrain what we have always viewed as the heart of the vehicle will not be mm-hmm. their their sort of dna identity marker anymore and i think at that point how many people do you need designing an amazing electric platform if bosch makes the best one in the world or rimac does then what if you were if you were bentley why would you make your own just buy that and stick a body on it i think we're going to go into world of coach building of of coach building and of of calibration coach building and calibration the two c's i think yeah i think that was you know we did it and we're going to rewind in a second but you know we did a conference on uh design and you know a lot of the designers from art center which is a big design college out here uh were excited by the future because you know once the regulations begin to get lifted from a safety perspective because of autonomy uh, and because of like almost like a white labeled chassis and, and powertrain 
you could go back to designs that really push the boundaries again uh, because they don't have to conform to the restrictions. So I, I think there'll be like a, maybe a hybrid, you know, further down the road where, you know, you can have a, a body that's, you know, m you know more, uh, you know, voluptuous, like from the 30s or the 60s, uh, because you don't have to worry about, you know, the same kind of crumple zones. Well, absolutely. You know, you, you, you know, that's the way it used to be. You'd buy a Derby Bentley in the UK in the 40s, wouldn't you? And then you'd, then you'd take it to Park Ward or Mulliner and you'd have a different, you know, that's, that would be the coachwork of the vehicle. You know, the separate body and chassis will go back to that world, I think. But, yeah. I, but, but that's, an, you know, that's an aesthetic for me. It, it's yeah. a part of why I love cars, but it's not, it's not of mechanical interest to me. Okay. Um, so like many car enthusiasts, I feel a little bit rudderless at the moment. And, yeah. I, and when I feel rudderless, I naturally gravitate towards older cars because mm -hmm. the, the current stuff leaves me quite cold and I think we've sadly the industry has allowed itself to be moved in a direction particularly at the top end of the market that is no longer about driving it's just about being a peacock it's about being seen it's about making noise mm -hmm. and um, I think it's been damaging to the way the rest of the world perceives that side of the business and, and what those cars stand for because I think 30 years ago if you'd driven a lamborghini countach 1990 it would have been a diablo if, yeah. you, if you'd driven a, if you'd driven a diablo through my hometown in bristol first of all you wouldn't have seen one before mm -hmm. and people would have just loved it they'd have loved the theater the noise the sheer beauty the fact that it represented the fact that some human beings had got together not only designed this thing but made it a point of celebration if you drive a performante hurricane through bristol now you probably see four others and most people are just thinking bit of a knob <laughs> you know he's just showing off his money yeah you know that that reverence that used to be reserved for those vehicles has gone mm -hmm. and i think the um, it makes me very sad because it's something that i used to celebrate but i i almost am ashamed to be part of some of that now i don't want to be seen i mean i love supercars yeah but I, and i've got some nice cars but i tend to shy away from driving them in public sometimes i'd rather get in my 2cv or my little m2 yeah. because no one's judging me yeah and you're right i think that if you were to go back and say you know take an 037 out on the same road you'll probably get more attention in that than than the new uh you know car that's, that's... tell you what if you want if you want to if you want to take all these peacocks away at the chin to turn up in a 1957 2cv that's covered in rust wherever i go in that <laughs> she's a showstopper compared to you could turn up in a pink lamborghini and, and they wouldn't even look at it that i found that quite difficult over the last few years i i just i feel a bit out of sync with the way the media is moving because instagram and youtube and all that is now about simply hawking views over supercars and hypercars and they're, they're not really doing it for me at the moment if i'm honest with you i mean i you know some of them i can't even name someone said to me the other day have you driven or what have you and i went what's that i've even heard of it yeah and it's just another angular slightly ridiculous insect looking vehicle that that's whose performance is of no use to anyone <laughs> yeah well, on an, on an insect vehicle, I mean, one of the things that, you know, we have in our collection that kind of reminisces that is the uh, XKSS from Steve McQueen that looks very much like a bug. It's British Racing Green with these big bulbous eyes. And yeah. if that was a car you could drive, oh, yeah. would, would you drive that car if given the opportunity? Uh, yeah, I've driven, I've driven a few D-types. I've raced. In fact, do you know what? I, run, I won my plateau at Le Mans Classic in a D-type. That's I don't often, I don't often big myself up, but I did win. I've got a big cup that says D-type from Le Mans. Um, I love the fact that, you know, I just love the fact that, that they, um, which way around was it? They couldn't sell enough XKSSs, so they turned it into a D-type racing car. They couldn't sell enough D-type racing cars, so they did a road car. Which way around was it? Was it? The, the road car, it went from race car to road car, and the factory burned yeah. down. Yeah. Um, I think the XKSS is in the top five most beautiful cars ever made, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, and boy, do I have respect for the people that race the Ds. Mm -hmm. has, has, this, has the SS got the funky rear brakes that work off the gearbox with that? With that actuator is it, is it got that or is that just on the yeah, racing it's, car it's, it's everything except for the, the kind of the rear fear, fairing 
Uh, and it's got more interior components, but that's that's pretty so much it. Have you got that thing on a track? Have you have you have you tried to understand the rear brakes on it? I've never no. I, I I'm not uh, our collection manager. He's the only one who's allowed to drive it, unfortunately. So so, so the first time I drove the D-Type, I, it was Gary Pearson's car. Gary is one of the best people in the world at looking after them, engineering them, also driving them. He's one of that he's one of that rare breed, Gary Pearson. That he's he can span it the night before, then he'll go and stick it on pole position the next day. He's a brilliant human being. And he's so relaxed. And he just, I didn't, you know, I knew him reasonably well. He just basically goes, in you go, off you go. And I said, it's, you know, several million pounds worth of car, anything I should know. And he just went, yeah, stick it on pole because I want to win. I went, oh, okay. So I go, I go out, I go down the Mulsanne Strait. I love talking blindly about that. How cool is that? You get in the D-type, I go out, first time down the Mulsanne Strait. And I get, and I'm thinking, I've got a, I, last time I'd raced there, was in a Carrera Cup car, a modern car. Yeah. So I then... I smashed the brakes on, just, you know, to get a feel for it at about 350 meter board. But, and the thing is, the speed, the way it accrues speed is exponential. There's no drag at all. It just keeps going. Yeah. And, I, and the thing, the front discs hook up and I get a bit of dive. In we go. We're braking. And then about one Mississippi after that, the rears just lock up. And it just starts doing this. Down the, and I'm thinking, well, that's great. So I've just got in a D-type and I'm now going to crash it. So I went round, finished the lap, pulled straight into the pits and went, Gary, the brakes. And he went, oh, yeah, I didn't tell you about those. He said, they're a bit weird. And I said, yes, I've just found that out as I went into the chicane at the Mulsanne Strait. He said, yeah, there's, a, there's basically a, it's a mechanical pump works off the gearbox mm -hmm. that powers up the rear brakes. And what happens is that as you, as you apply the, your, pre your brake pressure, the fronts hook up before. So the caliper takes the pressure, crimps the rotor, and then one Mississippi afterwards, the rears decide to come in. But it's determined by how much pressure you've got on the pedal. So if you what you have to do is bleed the brakes in and allow the rears to come in. And really go into it, yeah. And, 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 and I, I, they sold that as a road car? I mean, <laughs> how, how did everyone not die? Yeah. They only made 16 of them. <laughs> oh, it, I mean, it is just, yeah. and it, it, is, it is something of such rare beauty, isn't it? And I think um, uh, uh, Carlos Monteverdi has a, has the, what they call the ex Jim Clark, what it is, it's Jim Clark's white um, short nose D, which is the closest thing, looking competition car to an XKSS, isn't it? And, and every time that comes off Gary Pearson's trailer, you just stand there and go, <laughs> I'm, uh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, I'd I'd love to drive that. I I I'd, I'd love that era of Jaguar to race. <laughs> is, is the sweet spot for me. They yeah. are because they because the modern engines have got 400 horsepower now, 380 400 horsepower um, from that wide angle uh, head thing, and 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 they just they really go. And the amount of power to grip means they actually feel quite like a GT a sort of Porsche GT3 car they've got the ability that you know they can really let their backs moving around they're quite active um and of course they're beautiful sorry I've crapped on for too long about those no, but I no, do love them great. no I mean that, that's the kind of story we want to hear and I think most people don't get the opportunity to, to drive those kinds of cars so just explaining it's wonderful and what you do is you you you, you step out of something like Le Mans classic in a D-type and you you only have one initial thought and that is the people that did this in period were insane. They really were. And they did it with two drivers. Um, yeah. Well, that's not, I, I you know, I, I was doing three hours at a time, share, two of us sharing a 24 hour race with two drivers in one of those. They were bonkers. And the quantities of amphetamine they must've been taking to stay awake yeah. must've been uh, industrial to say the least. But, but the, even even now, I know they've got a bit more power now, but I was seeing one, even on the short straights, it was doing 175, 177, I think it was the D-type was. I mean, properly fast car. Yeah. And so, you know, all, all of this, as you know, you know, is going into, um, you know, our, our virtual, you know, Monterey Car Week, uh, Peterson Car Week this year, uh, because of all the cancellations and, you know, with everything, you know, being disrupted with uh, the pandemic, um, you know, we still wanted to bring enthusiasm to, you know, our audience and the global audience of, you know, car enthusiasts and non-car enthusiasts who are looking for entertainment. Um, have you been to, you've been to uh, Monterey Car Week before, correct? I've never gravitated towards it, but everyone says it's such a great event that I will next year go. And I think 
this year I was quite, I was I was planning on coming and now I can't. I think like a lot of people, I'm next year I'm gonna be going to every event I can just in case we can't do them again. Um so I would, the, the good bit of doing a speed week, which covers yeah. off revival and, and um, the festival speed. So I'm going to be involved in that, but I'd love to come and, and see the cars. I mean, the, ultimately your country is the home of the motor car. Now you have a unrivaled passion for the things and that's to be celebrated. So I suspect I'll be spending more and more time over there enjoying cars. And you, know, you bring up a really good point about car culture, you know, car culture, um, it has kind of its different interpretations around the world. What what is your favorite kind of scene around the world? Uh, you know, has it is it U.S. or is it somewhere else that you've enjoyed? It's um, I think my favorite expression of car enthusiasm is probably an event at Spa Francorchamps in September called the Spa Six Hours. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, a mighty collection of racing cars mostly old but getting into the more modern era as well it's quite a low-key event they don't try and hawk it about you know in quite the same way that some of the others do so it's not it's about the cars and the people yeah. and most most of the owners turn up in something quite nice and modern so you'll find lots of bmw m cars and audi rs6s and alpinas so they'll arrive in one of those and then there'll be a truck with their d-type in it or their ford falcon or their austin healy or their can-am car and there's something very inclusive about it. You know, if you've got an MG that's worth $30,000, you're as welcome as the bloke that's got a Daytona Cobra in the same race. And, and there's reciprocal interest between the two groups. Yeah. And there's a love of driving. There's a love of slip angles. Uh, there's a love of telling stories. Um, there's a mutual support as well. So I think that's, my, that's the event that makes me proudest to be into cars. That yeah. sounds a bit glib, but that, that's the one I love the most. In terms of actual scenes, I'm a bit, I'm quite I'm a bit of a loner. I'm known to be a bit of a loner, for people that know me. So I don't tend to want to gather with people to, to, to do cars. But I do, I've got, a, I've got a bit of a thing about old French taps from the sort of 60s, 70s, 80s. I've got a couple of sheds full of rubbish that I bought over the years. And I just, there's something about the dainty engineering from that period that's so fit for purpose the cars are so light and so interesting and brave Yeah. that I, I'm every time I get in my two CV, my heart melts and I just, I just love the thinking that went into it, the execution. And there are so many lessons that can be learned by the car industry now by looking at cars like that. You know, mm. on, the, on the back of the second world war, the French people needed a car that would travel at 40 kilometers per hour over a plowed field with two sheep in the back. So, so Citroen made that car and it, it turned out to be, change, right? <laughs> it, it, it turned out to be a legend and even now it's a brilliant car. Yeah. But what do we have now? We have two and a half ton SUVs that take one person to work and back. And, I, and that's not progress. It's just a world that's gone mad. Uh, and, uh, and so I love that, that old French scene and I'm an M car fan, as you know, I've got lots of M cars and I'm yeah. a Porsche shadow cause I've got quite a few Porsches and I, adore the 911 so i've got lots of little areas but if i could choose one event it would be spa to demonstrate how what i love about cars and if you could go back and give your younger self advice on collecting what would you say god yeah do you, you know something about me because everyone asks me this yes <laughs> i wouldn't have sold my 993 gt2 in 2007 for 140,000 pounds because it just <laughs> sold 1.2 million ah! <laughs> These things were. I had a nine. When my kids were born, they used to go to school in the back of a nine nine three RS that I traded for forty thousand pounds. That's just gone for five hundred grand. Um, But for me, far better to have loved and lost. All of the cars I owned have gone up in value, but I just don't care. Yeah. I don't look at the clothes I wear. I don't need any. I'm I'm never. I'm never going to look smart. I don't want to live in a big house. I've got all the cars I could ever want that keep me interested. Yeah. love my children and i get to race lots of cars that people very kindly put me in so i'm i love the fact that i own the 993 gt2 and i've got several photos of me fully sideways on it rinsing the back tires not many people can say that own them now yeah um and i'm very <laughs> proud of that fact i'm very very proud of it but yeah so the young me i'd have said of course i'd hang on to some of it you know yeah. there were 12 there were 12 of them chris why did you sell it <laughs> And where did you find it? That's the big question. A friend of mine had it. 
Oh, yeah. honestly, but in in the mid two thousands, you couldn't give this stuff away. Yeah. Honestly, nine nine not nine six four RSs were like twenty five thousand. No, yeah. no one kept. They were all slightly weird cars made of exotic materials, and they were Im immediately obsolete because they was they were used as track cars. Yeah. So you know, you had a nine nine three GT two. Do you have that, or did you buy a new GT two, or did you buy a you know the new GT three? The new GT three was a much better track car. So if you owned the G the old GT two, you sold it and bought the new GT three. Yeah. That wouldn't look very wise now, would it? Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I think it's uh, you know basically if you if you have the car, then you're enjoying it, and there's a point where the value gets so high that you're not able to enjoy it in the same way. So I think that's yeah, it's, exactly. it's a perfect way. I, I never want to. Yeah, I'm never going to be in that position. Yeah. You know, I've got a I have a I have a Ferrari five twelve TR that's done sixty just clicked over sixty four thousand miles. I've had yeah. it for seven or eight years, and that for me is all the car I ever need. I, I won't buy a modern supercar. Yeah. Because it doesn't do anything for me. This has a it's a great big gated gear shift and it's got difficult pedals and it, it's only as good as my inputs and it has a flat twelve that sounds to die for on an open pipe. It's everything I want in a Ferrari. It's obstinate, it's difficult, it's beautiful, it's a pain yeah. in the ass. And the modern cars don't do that for me. It doesn't it doesn't give me that sort of panoply of relationship that I get with that car. And I love the fact it's done all these miles. I, you know, people always say to me, Yeah, mine's done 4,000 miles and I just say to them well we go and drive it then you should be ashamed yeah and so this is you know this is the last one and kind of the, the sign off but you know two enthusiasts and you know the, the the person bringing their 2CV to the car show what is your advice going into you know the car world if you could give you know a one-liner to somebody who's really trying to just kind of enter the car world what's that you know toe dipping in the water what, as in to buy a car? In, into just enjoying the hobby in general, whether it's buying a car or uh, maybe even like renting a car for the day and, and taking it out. You know what? what oh, well, look, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's buying a car, stick to your guns. Always buy what you want. Don't buy what you think you should have or what the market is seducing you into buying. But fulfill your childhood dream. Imagine that you were whatever, whatever age you were, and the cars you used to drive and the things you used to read in road and track and car and driver when you were a kid fulfill those childhood fantasies that's what that's what being middle-aged is all about let's face it um and then try to be understanding and make sure it's a broad church it's very easy to sneer at people that aren't into your thing in the car world it's such a big world and i used to make that mistake 20 years ago i was a bit like that and 20 years ago i'd look at the old bloke with his 2 cv and go what are you doing that for that's a bit weird but I realized that was an immature, stupid attitude. It's a, it's a great thing to celebrate everyone that loves cars, as long as they're not doing it in an antisocial manner. You know, if you're in the middle of Monterey and someone's doing launch control in a Chiron, then you have every right to call them a you-know-what, because they are a you-know-what. But other than that, let's celebrate what everyone, you know, if you see some guy in a crazy Jap GTR, then go over and be interested in it. And then he'll come over and be interested in your weird little flat twin in your 2CV and, and um, you know car enthusiasm as we love it probably won't be around for another you know beyond 30 years it's going to be difficult so I really think now is the time to just everyone have a mutual hug and really enjoy what is a great time to love